you know it's a lot hotter up here when you have these lights on you. So I'm going to start sweating a little bit. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Frank and Jeremy for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, last year, uh, it's probably the second day or third day of the summit. Uh, I th felt like it was really important. It, everybody seems to be working towards some sort of a map or some sort of a way to reference the external structures and how they correlate with the internal structures of the foot. Because what we do every day is trim the feet and apply apparatuses for protection or performance. And <clears throat> like I had said to Frank earlier, there is a lot of confusion on the trim. We throw out words like balance and um, nobody really, we talk about balance, we can balance them to radiographs, we can balance them to a T-square or some sort of uh, hoof gauge. But when it comes to actually trimming or preparing the foot, there seems to be a lot of gray area, okay? And so I asked these guys for for the opportunity to speak because my goal is to simplify it. We, we use this all in a practical application every day. And my goal is to simplify this and actually hopefully start to have some clarity on this. So I, I thank these guys. Not only did I ask them to speak, but I asked them to have two parts so they, they generously gave me a spot um, tomorrow morning as well. So for most of you, who don't know me, I'm just going to tell you a quick run through a quick slide of, of who I am. Uh, my name is Steve Foxworth. I am a certified lameness specialist, a certified instructor, and a certified examiner through the ELPO. I started farrier work 14 years ago. Uh, I currently run a two year apprenticeship program and have been doing that for 12 years. And I will say that it is the fact that I have had apprentices with me every day is the reason why. I have the opportunity to stand up here and speak. Those guys will ask you so many questions and, and having to answer those questions over and over again, foot after foot, holds you accountable. And they catch you. They catch you if you say one thing on one foot and something else on another. You guys agree with that? Yeah? Those, those guys, they catch you. You cannot hide it. Okay. I earned my Certified Lameness Specialist in 2007 through the Equine Lameness Prevention Organization. I served on the Board of Directors from 2008 to 2011, and the Board of Directors elected me as President uh, in 2012, and it was not voluntary. Uh, I've been teaching these principles, or these guidelines, for the last nine years, and I've been super fortunate to go all across the US and in Europe doing workshops and conferences. And the reception of what we're teaching, because we're applying this in a manner that seems to be very practical, has been accepted quite a lot. Uh, I started working with exotic animals in 2007, and I'm currently the farrier for the Denver Zoo and the Colorado Springs Zoo. Now, <clears throat> in 2014, I presented the widest part of the foot study on exotic equids at the 48th annual uh, AAZV, the American Association of Zuvet Conference, and ran a workshop for 20 veterinarians teaching them how to apply these principles or how to look at the foot in a practical manner. So I put this slide in here. This was Daisy's idea. I don't know those of you, Daisy's a good friend of mine. And she said, Steve, you should probably put in a few slides and help you relax because I get a little tense. I hate speaking. But I put these up here for two reasons. This is my son, Christian, on the right side. Plays football for a small town in Colorado. That's my little girl, Courtney. She uh, loves to shoot. Very good, might I add. God, God bless her. Okay, But she also likes to cook and spend time with mom. And the only time that she's quiet is when she's laying down. So <clears throat> the reasons why I put this in here is for two things. One is because the people in that slide make me smile, and it helps me relax. And two, it's just to show that we're all the same. Everybody in this room has a family, a son, a daughter, a mother, a father, a brother, a sister, right? We're all the same. There's nobody that's any better or any worse. We just have different experiences. And it's important 
that we keep that in mind as we go through and trimming horses. I think, I think that oftentimes we get caught up in right and wrong, good and bad. Who's doing the right thing? Who's got the right protocol? Who doesn't? I'm mean, use this podium as an example. Someone will come along and say, this podium is a good, ex or is a good podium, right? Another individual will come along and assess this podium and say it's a bad podium. But, but the truth of the matter is what? It's a frickin' podium, right? It's not good or bad. It's not right or wrong. It's just a podium. And it serves a purpose. And it's a tool, right? And so if, if we pay attention to these things as we go through shoeing, if we deem something we've done as right, you get an emotional up, right? If you deem something that you've done as wrong, you get an emotional down, good or bad. And that emotional roller coaster is what affects us, okay, and, and oftentimes blocks us from being able to see things that are simple, right, and coming up with a solution. So as I go through this talk, I want you guys to all keep in mind that I'm neither right nor wrong, I'm not good or bad, and that I try to leave the morals out of horseshoeing because my intent is to get up every day just like you guys and go to work and help each animal that I work on. I do not know of an individual in this room that goes to work or gets up in the morning and puts on his pants and goes, I'm gonna see how many horses I can cripple today. And if I'm wrong, raise your hand. No? Okay, so my goal is let's keep that in mind and let's keep that in perspective. There is more talent in this room, okay? There's probably, more than half of you guys probably are three times the farrier I am. We all have different experiences. Everybody in this room is successful, and everybody in this room has struggles. So, let's get to hoof mapping. Hoof mapping is not new, right? Over 100 years ago, Russell came up with hoof mapping, right? He was searching for answers. That man was leaps and bounds ahead of his time. Okay? It would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall to see how the things that Russell was doing was perceived. And it's also interesting what was going on at that time that made Russell go, I have got to come up with something, right? Something that we can start assessing the foot and be consistent. And since that time, there's been multiple other individuals who have been instrumental at looking at some form of mapping. And not just looking at it, but trying to improve, improve upon it. Okay, Dave Duckett is a fabulous example. That man has made more waves and has been more instrumental than most anybody else in the industry for what he's done and what he's shown. But Dave was one of the first guys to start putting not just a map together, but start putting numbers and trying to be, make it more consistent and more precise. And each individual that comes along Okay? or each person that comes along and starts to adapt some sort of a map, their goal, you watch them, is to try to make it a little more precise and a little more accurate. Okay? Now, we all might have some different views of which part of it's important or which part of it's not, but each one of the individuals who go through this do the same thing. Ovenick has done the same, same thing. Ovenick's numbers might be looking at something a little bit different. Okay? And I will tell you, those two men, together, the turmoil and the strife that they've had in their lives, together, is the instrumental part of where we are today. Those two men has made the majority of people that are, that are moving forward in this room to look at things more in-depthly. Okay? So everyone goes along, we're, we keep looking at maps. The ELPO was one of those organizations, okay? Uh, I, I don't know how many of you know Dave Nichols, but Dave Nichols is a British farrier in the UK. He was a resident farrier at Lip Hook for many years. He's been an instrumental part of, of this particular summit. He served on boards and, and committees. Uh, but Dave Nichols, is, <coughs> he's extremely smart, and he is, absolutely understands the need for finding something that's consistent and repeatable, okay? So Dave was an instrumental part in starting the organization because he wanted to, to, to develop something that was consistent, okay? So if hoof mapping is not new, what is new, right? 
What is new? So, so what I was worried about, and, and what I've been here, I've been here nine years. I've come here nine years. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, we oftentimes are a little scared to put ourselves out there and say, this is, this is how I trim the foot. These are the things I look at. A, B, C, D, and E. You guys agree with that? For whatever reason, it's hard. It's hard for us to put ourselves out there. So I'm standing up here, and hopefully nobody throws any tomatoes at me, but I'm going to go through a step-by-step -step process of how to assess the foot. So if hoof mapping's not new, what's new is a system, okay? A system to consistently assess balance and hoof capsule distortions. The first step of the system is obviously hoof mapping, okay? And I don't care, there's been multiple people that, that have come up with a map and that get very close. I don't, I don't care whose map you use, but what do we take away from that map? Is it just to know where the attachments are on the inside of the foot, or is there more that we can do on a practical approach from the bottom of the foot? And that's my question. So I'm gonna go through a brief overview Many of you probably have seen the ELPO hoof mapping. It was presented here, I believe, in 2009 or 2010, uh, the study that we did. <clears throat> but if you're not, I'm gonna catch you up quick, and I'm gonna try to do the, keep this moving. If you have any questions about the map later, there's 25 or 30 ELPO members here that are familiar with it. You, you'll see them, they're wearing jackets that have logos on them, and, and they're more than happy to explain, if not, Come and visit with me, I'm happy to explain as well. But I'm gonna go through this fairly quickly. So after exfoliating a foot, and when I mean exfoliating, I'm talking about removing the chalky material until it becomes waxy. Mike Savaldi stuff. The first thing we assess, or the first things we look for, is what we call the dimple. And it's located at, at the back part of the central sulcus. And the way we developed our map was to try to have fail safes or to have more than one way to find a reference on the bottom of the foot. So in order to find the dimple, the first thing that we were looking at was the, the there's a V in the <clears throat> back part of the commissure, right? The commissure is almost an oval. So just inside that, cra or that peak there, we put a dot. It also seems to correlate with where the heel buttress and the frog buttress come together. That's the second thing we look at. And the third thing is there's actually a tissue change of where the heel bulbs are coming down and the frog tissue comes up. There, there almost becomes just a little bit of an indention. So we try to find three ways to find these references because as everybody knows, you're gonna come across feet that are either atrophied or diseased. It's hard to find the central sulcus or it's hard to find where the frog and the heel come together. Okay, so we try to find three different methods. The importance of finding that reference is that if you get that piece wrong or not in the spot <coughs> that <laughs> I said wrong. <laughs> if, if, you, if you don't get that correct to begin with, okay, it's going to throw you off the rest of the way. Second thing we do is we're looking at the central sulcus, and we're looking at the, the length of the central sulcus. So we look to verify the true apex of the frog. And what we found by many dissections and by peeling the sole off of the bottom of the foot at the corium level is that the length of the central sulcus okay, doubled was the length of the true apex of the frog at the corium level. And we did this multiple times over and over and over. So it became a very consistent reference for us to find the true apex of the frog because there's multiple different types of feet that we're gonna come across that either become stretched or narrowed or distorted or maybe they've had a thin sole and the frog is up over the top of that to help protect it. But being able to find the true apex of the frog is absolutely imperative because it's the first thing that we use to find the widest part of the foot. So we measure back one inch from the apex of the frog, we make a mark. The second thing we do, or the second way we find the widest part of the foot is the termination of the bars. And everybody in this room knows that the bar is nothing more than where your wall terminates, right? It goes around your heel, comes back, it's where the horn terminates. And, and surprisingly enough, it terminates at the same place at the corium level. When you fold that foot open or you peel the sole off of it, it terminates at the same place over and over and over again, regardless of what size foot it is, okay? So that's our second reference that we're looking at. Make a mark at either bar. We take and we draw a line from heel to heel, okay, at the white line, 
at the sole wall junction, okay? Or at the sole white line junction. And the reason why we're not looking at the wall is because the wall stretches and flares and breaks and does all sorts of things. But the reason for that is because we take a straight edge and what we're looking for is the widest part of the sole. So we'll take a straight edge, line it up with a frog, slide it to one side. We'll make a mark. We'll do the same thing on both sides, flipping it around and make a mark. It's very simple. We take a straight edge of any sort, lay it on the foot, scribe a line across there, okay? For the most part, you're gonna have at least two out of three of those marks line up. If you have one that's slightly off, we would use two out of three. But consistently, we have three out of three marks lining up. It's the widest part of the foot. From there, we measure forward on this size foot, on a medium foot, about an inch and three quarters. When I say a medium foot, I'm, I'm talking about a size ot to a size really a small two, okay? And that is the approximation of the tip of P3, all right? And the reason why I say the approximation is because when we went through the study, there was a variance plus or minus an eighth of an inch, okay? But plus or minus, an eighth of an inch. That's a very small variance. Ahead of that, we make a line or scribe a line two inches from the widest part of the foot, and we call that a good recommendation. Let's see, a good recommendation for the point of breakover to be placed. It's a starting point, okay? Some of horses, every, every horse is different, every foot is different, they have different jobs, they work in different surfaces, they <clears throat> live in different environments. Every horse is different. It's a starting place, but it's a place to go, yep, I'm gonna go forward with that. It's a place to go, yes, I'm gonna go further back than that, okay? Pathology is a, a big key in that. Dr. Silverman you know, touched a little bit. The stuff that he was showing there with the horses landing on the lateral side of the foot and jamming up was pretty cool. So, scribe a line, where are the edge of the breakovers? Really quick, it's simple. The widest part of the foot is here. The approximation of the tip of P3 or the coffin bone is here. And the breakover or 50-50 approximation is there. The thing that is beneficial and the thing that has been really helpful for the ELPO is how many lines are on that foot? Three, three marks, right? You have the widest part of the foot, the tip of P3 and the breakover. What that allows is for us to start looking at the foot, okay? So in 2008, I know it was presented here, but I'm just gonna touch this really quick. Uh, the ELPO got together to do a study. The important piece about this is that there was over 12 different farriers that all participated, that all got a foot and, and were mapping out feet, okay? And there were three different veterinarians, I believe, and we're talking, we looked at 100 feet and it was a live horse study, so every horse was exfoliated. This was horse uh, JLF or GLF. Every foot was mapped. On the lateral side, there was a quarter inch piece of solder. On the medial side, there was a copper BB. Okay, radiographs were taken. And the reason why we had a quarter inch piece of solder on one side and a copper BB on the other is because we wanted to make sure that our beam was going down the center. We wanted to shoot straight down the center of, of the widest part of the foot. So we had two questions that we were trying to answer. The first was, is does the widest part of the foot line up with the center of articulation of the coffin joint? That was number one. Okay, we answered that question. The answer to that question is no. It does not consistently line up with the center of articulation of the coffin joint. But we also answered the question why. What we found was is that horses that have an upright foot, if this is the widest part of the foot, horses that have an upright foot, the joint is forward, which means where the widest part of the foot lines up is behind that, okay? And if a horse has a negative or a flat angle, the joint is back, which means the widest part of the foot is in front of that. So it made perfect sense why the widest part of the foot does not necessarily line up with the center of articulation of the coffin joint. 
The second question we were asking was, is it a consistent spot, a static reference that we can measure from to find the tip of P3? And the answer to that question was yes. Okay. <clears throat> Plus or minus an eighth of an inch on, on 100 feet. So if the first step is of, of the, of the um, system is to map the foot out, the second step is going to be assessing the hoof. So I'm going to assess five things. Okay? The first thing that we're going to look at is the frog. Is the frog stretched? Is the frog atrophied? Okay? So we're talking about length and width. Is the central sulcus quality healthy? Is it diseased? Does it have a rounded bottom? Does it have a deep crevice? And the last thing that we look at that the frog tells us is the depth of the commissures. Okay? And, and what it's a very simple thing. If you have a deep commissures, then you probably are okay to start investigating with your knife or your nippers to exfoliate that. If there's no depth to your commissures at the apex of your frog, you want to think long and hard about getting your knife out and starting to trim the sole. Okay. You may just be taking away a huge part of the protection of that foot. The second thing I'll assess, or the second thing we assess, is the heels. We hear, oh, it's an upright heel, or it's a run forward heel, or an underrun. How upright, how run forward? Are they both run forward? Is one run forward more than the other? Is it crushed? Is it sheared? The third thing we assess are the bars. Okay? And if you can just remember, if you can just remember this about the bars, all I want you to think about is the curvature. Okay? The curvature is going to dictate and tell us a lot of things. Toe length. You know, we've, I've, I have been given more than one prescription talking about backing the toe up, but very rarely do I get how to back the toe up or how far to back the toe up. And if you get a radiograph and they tell you, I want it to back up to here, how does that radiograph correlate with the foot you're trimming, right? It's a little bit hard. But if you can map the foot out and you consistently find the tip of P3, you're going to have a better answer for that. And the last thing, and probably one of the most important things that we probably have, have overlooked in the past, is uniform wall thickness. Is it flaring? Is it curling? And what part of the foot does what? Okay. What part flares? What part curls? So in order to assess those things, we have to understand how the hoof grows. If we can become clear and we can all start to agree on how the hoof grows, I think we're going to start communicating a lot better. So traditionally speaking, if we want to align the hoof pasture and access and we're trying to, to, you've got a low heel and a long toe, we're going to leave the heel and trim the toe to align the hoof pasture and access. Okay? And if the horn grew straight up and down, that would be practical. But the horn doesn't grow straight up and down. The horn grows in this direction. So the, the longer we leave the heels, the more the heel starts migrating forward. Okay? So, which gives the optical illusion to the eye that it has no heel, and reality is that it's probably got too much heel. But it's the direction that the horn has moved. Okay? And it can only support so much before it starts folding over and crushing. It can only support so much. Okay? So as we go through this animation, just pay attention. This is a, a computer-generated image of how the foot grows. And if you want to see it again, I'll, I'll try to do it a couple times. But as, as the foot grows, you see the heel start to migrate forward. Okay? You can even see a little bit of a bulge in the hairline and the toe gets long, okay? Which creates the optical illusion of a low heel and a long toe. And it is an optical illusion. This is what it looks like from the solar view. If we take and we mark where the dimple is, 
and we draw where the widest part of the foot is. I'm going to do this animation or this graphic a few times. We're going to look at things one at a time. Okay? If I assess the frog on this, I would say that the frog seems fairly healthy. It's fairly wide. It's not contracted. It's not uh, atrophied. I would say the length of it is, has got a rounded tip to it. It's not stretched or pointed. And I would say the central sulcus is, has a little bit of a crevice, a little, little bit of disease to it. So maybe that's something that I would address. But that's the first thing I would do is assess my frog. Okay? The second thing we're going to do is we're dividing, we're dividing this foot in half. Okay? We're going to assess it the back first and then the front. We're just dividing it in half. It's probably the most important thing that the widest part of the foot does. It's so probably the most important thing that the widest part of the foot line does. It's going to help us assess the back half and then the front half. And we could go one step further and draw a line down the center and make it in quadrants. But for this talk, we're just going to talk about the back half and the front half. So watch the generation. The, as, as the first thing that I want you to watch is the heels. As the heels start to grow and get longer, you will see the heel start to move forward and inward. It becomes very clear. Okay? So the back half of the foot, the heels move forward and inward. As that happens, okay, the frog generally becomes out of contact with the ground okay, and starts to become atrophied. There also seems to be pressure right at the middle third of the frog. Okay, where most horses test positive to navicular pain. I'm going to back it up. We're going to look at it again. But this time we're going to assess the bars. Pay attention to the curvature of the bars. And because the wall wraps around, goes and terminates into the frog at the widest part of the foot, the bars have no choice but as the heels move forward to start bending. So, if I was to take that foot and you looked at one side that had a straighter bar and one side had more curvature, it only makes sense that the side with more curvature is longer or has more length or is more distorted. Now that we're done looking at the back half of the foot, the front half as it grows from the widest part of the foot forward, starts to go forward and out. Okay. Now, does that have to do with, with the position that the wall is in or the foot at the back half of the stride and how much strain there is? I'm not certain, but I would suggest that. Okay. The back half goes forward and inward, and the front half goes forward and outward. Whether it's just outward to the medial side or outward to the lateral side, it still goes forward and outward. So understanding how distortions or how the foot grows and how distortions occur, okay, how the foot grows, allows us to start assessing <coughs> the foot. The last part of this is the part that I would like to see if we could start to come together and simplify. I hope we can. I hope, I hope that we can, some of this stuff makes sense. Okay? And that's balancing the foot or the trim. And, and I've been here for nine years and I've heard multiple things about trimming. Okay? And it is so inconsistent. It is extremely inconsistent. But I think one of the things that William Russell said about symmetry, about his belief in, that the foot is symmetrical, may not be that far off. So, here's the left hind of a warm blood. And the first thing I'm going to do is assess my frog, right? What does my eye see? The width of the frog looks fairly healthy. The length of the frog looks fairly healthy. Okay? The central sulcus does not look diseased. It's got a, a closed bottom to it. And the depth of my commissures are not that deep. There is some depth, and it's hard to see in a 2D picture. There's enough depth for me to go, okay, I'll, I'll just scrape the, across the top of that and see um, 
or take, take away the chalky material until it comes waxy. But the first thing that my eye is drawn to after that is this, right? We talk about uh, oftentimes the lateral side has more curvature to it, right? Shoe shaping, forging, we've got a straight medial side, a bit more curvature on the outside. And sometimes it can be quite excessive, right? So my eye is drawn to that immediately. The side with the more curvature is the lateral side. Okay. Now, if I locate my dimple and just mark a line across the back part of the foot, I can draw on my heels. Okay. So now, as, as you're putting a mark on the foot, you're starting to assess the back half of the foot and the distortions. Everybody in this room can see that the lateral heel is forward of the medial heel. And the medial bar is straighter, and the lateral bar has more curvature in it. So the two go together. They go together. After I've assessed that, the next thing I'm looking at is because I know the bars terminate at the corium level, at the widest part of the foot, I make a line for the approximation or I'm going to assess the front half of the foot. If I put a line at where the dimple is and assess the distance from the dimple to the widest part of the foot and then make a mark to the front of the foot and assess from the widest part of the foot to the front, I can see that the toe length is obviously a little bit longer. Okay, It's just that simple. Now. In tomorrow's talk, I'm going to go over a grading scale, a numbering system for how long your heels are, a numbering system for how distorted your bars are, a numbering system for how healthy your frog is, a numbering system for your toe length. Okay? It is a system. But I have to show you, without doing that, how simple this is. The first thing I do is trim the greatest distortion, which was the lateral heel. And, if, and by doing nothing more than just trimming that, it's very apparent to see how much the symmetry of that foot changes on either side. Now, the curvature of my bar is the second thing I'm going to trim. If you've noticed, I have not exfoliated anything from the foot. Right. So the curvature of that bar is now less, or at least the distance that it is from the edge of the frog is less. Okay, that's the two side by side. It starts to, to change rapidly. I do the same thing with the medial heel and the medial bar. Now if we're just assessing the back half of the foot, it's easy to see that those two are way more symmetrical and way more similar than they were in the beginning. So there is something to understanding the curvature of the heels and the bars. I go ahead and exfoliate the rest of my foot and I'm taking a look at my toe length and my wall <coughs> thickness. And as I draw a line from one side to the other, you can start to see how symmetrical the actual sole is. There is a little bit more curvature. It still appears to the eye on the lateral side. Okay? Everybody can see that. It looks like there's more curvature here still. right? And this is just a little bit straighter. The greatest distortion is furthest away from its origin. It's a very simple thing. You're going to have the most distortion, the furthest away from where it originates. So by simply just trimming that wall off, you're going to change the look of that foot. Now look at the lateral side and the curvature of that versus the medial side. Now it almost looks like there might be a little bit more curvature here, and this is a little bit straighter. And all we did was took away the wall height, right? Any amount of wall that is not supported by sole can flare, can curl, can crack, can break. It's a very simple concept. 
but it doesn't take very long to see how that foot starts to change. I rasp the foot flat, or I'm sorry. You can see the difference of, of the distortion and the distance of the wall on either side. So I rasp the foot flat. Just by rasping the foot flat changes what it looked like when I had just nippered it. You can see now that the wall is even more narrow and closer and a bit more uniformed. If you look at the uniform wall thickness and you take and look at it on this side and you look at it closely, you can still see that it is not uniformed and it's still a bit stretched or flared. By simply rasping that okay, and using the wall that's further back in the quarter and having that become uniform, you're going to see the symmetry of your foot change. I do the same thing on both sides. Okay. Now, there's before and there's after. If Russell Wilson, or Russell Wilson, if William Russell was doing this over 100 years ago, and this is what he was seeing, I could certainly see how he would suggest that the foot is actually symmetrical. I believe that that guy was trying to develop as many tools as possible to help define balance 100 years ago, or over 100 years ago. But I think as we go through this, and we pay attention, and more people get together, and more people assess the foot, and more people approach it with the intent, with the intent to help each other out. The slogan that we've got, or that, that Frank's got out there, is what? Coming together. Coming together for healthy hooves. The energy of this particular summit and conference has changed from the way it was nine years ago. There are more people that come here and come together and share ideas, not with the intent to make one person right and one person wrong, or one person better and one person worse, but with the intent to gain knowledge and tools and learn how to apply those tools in a manner that is most beneficial for the horse. Because there are no two horses that are the same. There are no two feet are the same. But you can assess distortions consistently by using this method. I've done it on three feet that I'm going to show tomorrow. An upright foot, a quote unquote normal foot, and a flat foot. Okay? So if I can do it on all three of those feet, we can do it on just about anything. They just have different distortions. The foot is just distorted in a different area. I can throw a map on it and put a shoe on it. Okay. And that foot becomes fairly symmetrical. So here are my conclusions. One, hoof mapping is the first and most essential step. Or most essential step in the system, I'm sorry. By locating the widest part of the foot, you can assess distortions back to front. The back half of the foot comes forward and inward. The front half of the foot goes forward and outward. It's a very simple thing. We, we get caught up in making it extremely complicated. Understanding how the foot grows allows us to start to recognize distortions. But we have to understand, we have to come together and realize that the foot does not grow straight up and down. The foot grows at an angle. The horn tubules grow at an angle. Being able to consistently assess distortion, being able to consistently assess distortion is the key in balancing the foot. And last, having a system is extremely helpful in communication. Okay? And what I mean by that is I work with multiple, multiple vets in the state of Colorado. I get to work with multiple vets uh, every time I travel and I do stuff with the zoos. And being able to communicate these things to them and show them, to be able and teach 20 vets 
at a Zuvac conference, and all of them go, I got it. Every single one of them on cadaver feet, doing two or three cadaver feet apiece. Every single one of them going, well, that made sense. That was easy. I don't think we need to make it that hard. I think it's a lot simpler than what we've made it. I think there are probably many people in this room that are doing this already that don't know it. I think in time, all these successful farriers that are out here, I don't care if you're a traditional farrier or a barefooter or a glue-on chew person or a, you know, ELPO farrier, or, it doesn't matter. Farriers that are successful naturally start migrating to these things. and I don't even know if we know it. But if we can start to use this and have a system and communicate in a way, if we can come together and be able to communicate in a way that is beneficial for horses, that is not right or wrong, good or bad, just an observation, who knows what the next five or 10 years have to hold for this industry. Thank you.